morning, everyone, and welcome to our service, and welcome also to our online viewers. The joy of the Lord is your strength, Nehemiah 8, verse 10. <clears throat> A special word of welcome this morning to the Reverend Dr. Michael Barry, ex-moderator. I trust that you'll feel very much at home with us this morning. Uh, the letter here from the Reed family was just given to me a few minutes ago, and I'll read it out. Dearest Draperstown Church family, we do sincerely hope that this wee card finds you knowing our beloved's leading and guiding moment by moment. We are writing to you to thank you for all your kindness and prayerful support over these many years. As Arthur Pink writes, the measure of our love for others can largely be determined by the frequency and earnestness of our prayers for them. We have known your prayers for God's work amongst the precious souls of the Maasai and thank our Lord for you. Thank you also for your kindness. Thank you for your most recent gift of £1,630 towards God's work. And please pray that God will lead and guide us in all things for his glory. And may our Lord bless you all and draw you even closer to himself. We send this with all our love and thanks and our precious Saviour, Gary and Mary Reed. Some announcements. The midweek Bible study and prayer meeting will DV take place as usual on Wednesday night at 8 p.m. in Tubermore. <clears throat> the Hope 365 Ethiopia trailer will be back in the grounds of our church by popular request on Thursday the 7th of May until Thursday the 9th of May to receive clothes, shoes, bags, etc as well as rags, i.e. old worn and torn clothes, etc. Leaflets and suitable bags available in the vestibule from today onwards. Then the PW will meet DV in Dripperstown tomorrow week, Monday the 22nd at 8pm. The meeting will take the form of an AGM and a bring and buy sale. The ladies are asked to bring their suggestions regarding speakers, etc., for the new session due to commence in September. We were sorry to learn of the death on Monday of Mrs. Anna Reid Collibaki, who was the sister of Mrs. Sarah Kenning. Our thoughts and prayers are with the Kenning family at this sad time. The services next Sunday will DV be taken by the Reverend Dr. David Murphy, retired minister of Cunningham Memorial Church. For anyone requiring the service of a minister, I can put you in touch with the Reverend John Martin, minister of Colnari and Swatra. These are all the necessary announcements, and I'll now hand you over to Dr. Barry. O oh God, you are my God, earnestly I seek you. My, thirst, my soul thirsts for you, my body longs for you in a dry and weary land where there is no water. Because your love is better than life, my lips will glorify you. I will praise you as long as I live and in your name I will lift up my hands. We've come to worship God today, and we're going to do that as we sing our opening praise. It's number 50 in the Mission Praise Hymn Book, Be Still for the Presence of the Lord.
Let us come to God in prayer. Let us pray. O oh God, you have brought us this new day, and you have wakened us with the dawn. You teach the morning to awaken the earth, and we pray that you would help us to shake the slumber of the night from our eyes and from our minds, that we could concentrate upon you. We thank you that you have promised that you would be with us when we gather to bring our praise and worship. And so as we meet in your presence now, we ask that you would grant us your Holy Spirit to lead and to direct our thinking and our praise. And we ask, O oh God, that like Isaiah of old, we would have a vision of your glory, high and lifted up, that you would help us to see into heaven today, to see you as you really are in all of your splendor and majesty and glory. And we pray for your power, O God, your cleansing power that can forgive our sins. We have to confess to you that we have not lived as you call us to live. And we ask that as we meet here today, you would speak to us, that you would challenge us, that you would remind us that in Jesus there is forgiveness and there is cleansing from sin. And we pray that as we would, for, as we would confess our sins, that we would know your forgiveness. We pray, O oh God, that as we meet here, we would be conscious that there are many around the world today who will join their hearts and their voices in the praise of your great name. And we thank you for your church of which we are a part. And we pray that we might be conscious that you have called many, men and women and young people, to be your people, to be salt and light in their communities, and to live for you. So be with us and bless us in our time together. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. There's a lovely little verse in the book of Psalms, Psalm 86, which says this, Teach me your way, O Lord, and I will walk in it. Give me an undivided heart that I may fear your name. I will praise you, O Lord my God, with all my heart. I will glorify your name forever, for great is your love towards me. You have delivered me from the depths of the grave. And as we meet here today, it's wonderful to know that the Lord forgives people who come to him humbly, confessing their sins, that he renews them. And we'll be thinking about that later in our service as well. I want to thank uh, Trevor for his invitation to lead services here uh, with you this morning, and we pray that uh, God would indeed bless us. I want to thank uh, Gordon for his kind uh, words of welcome and for all the help that he has been to me uh, in the run-up to this service. Rules are very important. If you're playing games, it's good to have rules. If you're at school, there are rules there too. And very often, whenever I go into classrooms, up on the wall, there is a list of rules. And there might be rules a bit like this. Always listen to the teacher. That's a good rule. Be kind and respect one another. 
stay in your seat. Whenever I went to school, and maybe some of you are the same, you dared to move out of your seat. But sometimes whenever I go into classrooms today, children are up and about and they're moving over here and they're walking over there. And school classrooms can be very untidy and messy. It's a good job sometimes to stay in your seat. Or what about this one? Don't talk without permission. Again, whenever I was at school, you hardly lifted your eyes off your work. You never looked at the person beside you, never mind talk to them. It's good to be quiet and to work hard. Or what about keeping your desk neat and clean? And those rules in, in a school situation are to help the children as they learn and as they grow. But I wonder, what is the most important rule there? Well, usually the most important rule comes at the, at the top. And in the wee list that I read out there, always listen to the teacher. That's very important. One day a man came to Jesus and he said, Jesus, what's the most important rule? He used the word commandment, but that's really what it means. What's the most important rule? Jesus said, well, first of all, I need to tell you that there are ten commandments. I wonder if you know the ten commandments. Did you learn them when you were young? Can you remember them? More importantly, do you keep them? If you think it's hard to remember the Ten Commandments, whenever Jesus was on the earth, the Jews actually had 613 commandments. There were 248 do's, and 365 don'ts, 613. It's hard to remember all those. But what's the most important one? Well, listen to what Jesus said to the man. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. This is the greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. So the most important thing for us to do is to love God. But the second one, which is very close to that, is that we've got to love one another. And Jesus was saying, if we could keep those two commandments, the rest would be easier to keep. If we could only love God with everything we have, if we could only love other people the way we love ourselves, then all the other commandments would be easier to keep. I have a confession to make. It's not easy to keep the commandments. I need help to do it. And thankfully, the Lord Jesus has promised that he would help us, that he would strengthen us, and that, we would, that he would keep us on the right path. So we need to pray every day and ask for his help so that we could keep the two great commandments and keep all the other ones as well. Let's pray. 
Dear Father, we thank you that you love us so much that you have given us rules so that life might be better. Help us to keep those rules. Most importantly, help us to love you and help us to love other people. We pray for the young people here in uh, Draper's Town. We ask that you would bless them, bless their homes, help their parents, their teachers, to guide them in a heavenly direction. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to sing him. 367 Jesus is Lord creation's voice proclaims it short passage from John's Gospel, chapter 21. If you have a pew Bible, it's page 1090. John chapter 21, we're going to read from verse 15. This was after the resurrection. Jesus had met with the disciples. They had brought in a miraculous a catch of fish, and they've had breakfast on the beach. And this is what happens next. John chapter 21, verse 15, let us hear the word of God. When they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you truly love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said, you know that I love you. 
Jesus said, Feed my lambs. Again Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you truly love me? He answered, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, Take care of my sheep. The third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my sheep. I tell you the truth. When you were younger, you dressed yourself and went where you wanted. But when you're old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you to where you do not want to go. Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. Then he said to him, Follow me. Amen, and we know that God will bless this reading from his word. We bring our prayers of thanksgiving and intercession to God. Let us bow together in prayer. Let us pray. Our loving Heavenly Father, we thank you for the offerings that have been presented to you today. We ask that you would bless those offerings. Bless those who have given them. And use both gift and people for your glory here. We pray that you would bless the congregation uh, here in Draperstown. We ask that you would help them in their witness to this community. Be with the elders and leaders and with each family connected to the congregation. We pray for those in, who are sick, those who are going through difficult times, those who have suffered bereavement. We pray that you would draw close, and that you would bring your comfort and your support in each of those cases. Be with Trevor and with Barbara and help them in the role to which you have called them. Bless their ministry here. And we pray that it would bear fruit, that together with the congregation, they would see the gospel proclaimed and that they would see people one for the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you for the uh, message that we received from Mary and Gary Reed, and we pray for them at this time together with their family. Undertake for them. Lay your hand upon them and bless them and their future. Lord, we live in a world in turmoil. There are wars and rumors of war. We pray that you would bring peace to our world. And we think of the church around the world, particularly those who are persecuted because they love the Lord Jesus. And we know that there are many who will meet today in fear and in trembling. Lord, protect them. And may their light shine brightly. And may Jesus be uplifted. And finally, Lord, we pray for ourselves. You know our needs, our concerns, our hopes and fears. Lord, be with us in the week that lies ahead and help us in everything we do to live for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen.
We're going to uh, sing again. Hymn 473. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I wonder if you find it difficult to say those three little words, I love you. Maybe on Valentine's Day, there's still some romance left in you. I know sometimes on the 14th of February, I have to struggle a bit, but I usually manage to get a card and some flowers maybe take my wife out for a meal, do something to show her that I still love her. But I wonder how easy it is for us to actually say those words, I love you. Or maybe on Mother's Day, we would buy our mother's uh, present or some flowers, we would get a card But how easy is it for us to say, Mom, 
I love you. I was reading in the newspaper just last week of a columnist who said that throughout her childhood she could only remember one occasion where her mother said, I love you to her. And the result is that every day in life she says to her children, I love you. Sometimes those words are hard to express. I wonder if we were to go out onto the street this morning and conduct a survey and ask people as they come from their place of worship, what is the most important thing about God? And I imagine that most people would say God is love. We like to think of a God who loves us, who cares for us, who provides for us. A God of love is much better than thinking about the God who is just, or a God who is vengeful, or a God who is filled with wrath, or a God who will punish sinners. And yet the Bible talks about such a God. But we would prefer to think of God as the God of love. It seems that for many people today, that is the only thing to associate with God. It's a, me it's a, a popular message from many pulpits. There are not many times when I preach about the wrath of God. It's much easier to tell people that God loves them rather than that God is going to punish them if they are remaining in their sin. Imagine if we had no Bible. And we depended on preachers and teachers to tell us what the Bible actually says. I wonder how much we would actually know about the gospel story. If we weren't able to read it for ourselves, and you were depending on people like me, I wonder how much you would know about the Bible's story. And yet that was the case before the invention of printing, before people had a Bible in their own home, before people were able to read the Bible. They depended on the minister or the teacher explaining it to them. And of course, many people had a very imperfect knowledge. But the same was also true in Jesus' day there would have been scrolls in the local synagogue, a long uh, scroll where the message was written, the Old Testament books were written, and they would have been read at the Sabbath services. But people had no copies at home. And amazingly, what happened was they would start to memorize those passages and they would try to learn them off by heart so that where you and I might go home and pick up our Bible and turn to a particular passage or verse and read it, they would recall it from their memory. And that's why, for example, as the Apostle Paul is writing his letters, he's able to quote from the Old Testament so well. The problem was that the only way the people could, under, uh, could learn about the Bible's message was from what the scribes and Pharisees and their priests were teaching them. And very often that wasn't accurate. And that was the problem that Jesus had. 
coming up against people who thought, believed the wrong thing about the Bible's story. They supplanted God's message with their own. The people didn't realize that what they were hearing was in fact falsehood. That's why it's important, like the Bereans of old, that whenever you hear a minister speaking, you go back to the Bible and you compare it, what he has said, with what you read there. And I hope that, for example, you don't sit there and say, well, the minister had said one thing, that must be true. Take your Bible, read it, and compare it with what you hear Sunday by Sunday. Fortunately, I know Trevor well enough to know that he's not going to teach you any falsehood. But you still have that responsibility to study God's Word. I can remember as a student going to conduct a service in a vacant congregation. And it was in a small rural area. And afterwards I was, in those days, the students being very poor would have been taken for a meal afterwards. And I was taken to this elder's house for a meal. His wife hadn't come to church. She had stayed at home to prepare the food. And as the three of us sat at the table, she turned to her husband and they said, well, what was the sermon about today? And I nearly choked because the man might well have said, I don't know, I wasn't listening. He might well have said, well, I actually fell asleep in the middle of it. He might have said, I lost my train of thought. It was so boring. But he didn't. He said, it was about sin. And Mary, do you know something? Smoking is not a sin. And obviously, he enjoyed a cigarette. Obviously, she didn't like him smoking. But he was able to tell her that the minister had said that smoking was not a sin. And I did say that. But I said it in the context that for most people in Northern Ireland, sin consisted in those days of not smoking, not drinking, not going to dances, not swearing. And as long as you didn't do any of those things, you weren't a sinner. Now, the Bible has a very different story about what sin is. And sometimes the minister can say things and it will be misunderstood. Sometimes he can say things in a clumsy way. And sometimes he can get it completely wrong. So let me encourage you to study God's Word, to learn what God is saying to you. You remember that whenever Jesus was under arrest and he had been tried and the disciples were not sure what to do and Peter was in the courtyard and three times someone would come up to him and said, excuse me, mister, aren't you with him? And Peter denied, oh, I don't know him. I'm not with him. And the third time we're told that a little servant girl, maybe 10 or 12 years of age, came to this big burly fisherman and said to him, Aren't you with him? And we're told that Peter denied Jesus with oaths and with curses. And as he looked at Jesus, Jesus turned and looked at him. And we're told that Peter fled, weeping. Today in 
John chapter 21, we read this story of how Jesus restores Peter. Now, for many people, Jesus restores Peter because Jesus is love. Jesus loves me. This I know, for the Bible tells me so. So what else could Jesus do? That's his nature. He's bound to restore Peter. Pat Peter in the head. Tell him that he's a good boy. I forgive you, Peter. But that's not what happened. Instead of reassuring poor, embarrassed Peter by saying, Peter, I love you, you're forgiven, Jesus asks Peter, Peter, do you love me? I'm sure Peter was feeling more than a little guilty each time he met Jesus. We know that he had a private meeting on the day of resurrection. We know that he was with other disciples on the evening and the following Sunday. There were times when Peter would meet Jesus, and I'm sure he was uncomfortable. You know what it's like if you've ever let someone down. Maybe you've promised to help them, and you didn't turn up. Maybe you said that you would be there to support them. And you weren't. Maybe you said you would write them a letter when they went away, but you didn't bother. Maybe you said you would pray for them, but you forgot. And every time you meet that person, that guilt, that embarrassment makes you feel uncomfortable. And I'm sure that Peter was not in a very comfortable place when he met with Jesus, having denied him three times. He couldn't get that night out of his head. Maybe there are things that you have done, said. And as always at night, when you're lying in bed and it's dark and you're with your own thoughts, and they come back. And sometimes the Holy Spirit uses those occasions to prompt us to think. Do I need to make an apology? Do I need to confess a sin? Do I need to change my ways? Peter couldn't get the night out of his mind. And so here in the beach, Jesus comes to Peter to deal with the matter once and for all. Do you truly love me more than these people love me? Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Do you truly love me? Yes, I truly love you. And, and Jesus is trying to bring home the point. Jesus, Peter had denied Jesus three times. And so Jesus asks him the third time, Do you love me? If, if, if Jesus really knows our human hearts, surely he would have known about Peter. Why did he ask him three times? Well, he wanted Peter to say those words, Lord, I love you. You see, it's easy to say, but sure you know that I love you. A man had been married to his wife for 50 years. And one night his wife said to him, John, do you love me? Woman, we got married 50 years ago. And I told you then that I loved you. And I told you that if anything changed, I would let you know. Now, that's hardly the way to encourage a loving relationship. And yet, men, how many of us are a bit like that, if you're honest? 
And I wonder how many of our wives long for us just to say those words. I was listening to a song on the radio the other day in the car. Have I told you lately that I love you? And as I was thinking about this, I thought, I really need to go home and speak to my wife. Have you told her lately that you love her? Have you told him lately that you love him? And Jesus wants to hear the words from Peter's mouth. It's not a case of saying, well, Jesus, you know all things. You know my heart. You know that I love you. Well, Peter, let's hear you say it. Jesus, I love you. But I wonder how many Christians there are. And that's really what their relationship with Jesus is like. When was the last time we told Jesus that we loved him? We take from him every day. He's bound to know that I love him. But do we tell him that? But let me ask you this. Perhaps you've never had a love for Jesus. Perhaps you've come to church and and, and Jesus has always been around, but you really don't have a relationship with him. You know about him, but really he's a stranger to you. You're more interested in your own life than in living for him. You're more interested in your own sins than living for him. But you see, Jesus died, gave his life that your sin might be forgiven. And today he appeals to you. You need a savior to forgive your sin. Will you accept him? Will you say to Jesus, thank you for what you've done for me. I love you. You see, Jesus didn't only want Peter to say, I love you. But he commands Peter to show that love by caring for other people. Feed the sheep. Feed the lambs. Care for people in the church. How much did Peter love Jesus? Let's see it in action, Peter. By the way you treat other people. Show how much you love me by how much you love others. Now here, Jesus is speaking specifically about Peter's role as a pastor in the church, caring for other believers. But the Bible makes it clear that our love does not stop within these walls. Our love is to be taken out into the world around us. Sometimes churches have stained glass windows. In the olden days, churches had plain windows like yours for a very important reason. Because what you were doing here on a Sunday was connected with what's happening out through those windows in the houses and in the businesses around you. And what you do here on a Sunday has got to be taken to the world outside. And the love that you have for Jesus has got to be shown to the people outside those windows. So don't think just about these four walls. If you love Jesus, you've got to show that love by the way you love the people outside. On the night they met in the upper room before the uh, crucifixion, Jesus said this, a new command I give you. A new command, love one another 
As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this all men will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Or on, another, uh, on the same occasion he said this, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word. Whoever does not love me does not keep my words. Jesus wanted his disciples to show their love for him in the way they loved each other. But on that occasion, instead of thinking about how much he loved Jesus, Peter was more concerned about where Jesus was going. Lord, why can't I follow you? I will lay down my life for you. And then Jesus gave him that terrible warning. Will you really lay down your life for me? I tell you that before the cock crows, you will deny me three times. You cannot follow me now, but one day you will follow me. And of course, on that occasion, Jesus was talking about Peter's death. And we believe that that Peter too was crucified. And indeed, some of the records indicate that he was crucified or he asked to be crucified upside down because he didn't feel worthy to have the same death as Jesus. But here in chapter 21 of John, Jesus speaking about Peter's death, but Peter is being reminded that it's in the context of loving Jesus and showing that love by loving the sheep. We must show how much we love Jesus by how we love other believers and how we love other people. <clears throat> you might well say to me, but hold on a wee minute. Do you want me to love everybody? There, there are people I don't like. Well, as I used to tell my congregation, there are people that I don't like even some in the congregation. But I love them. And as Jesus said to the lawyer, love the Lord your God and love other people as you love yourself. And so I have got to love other people, even those I don't like. I've got to love them the way I love myself. And I've got to put myself in a position where I do anything for them. Even to the extent that I've got to be willing to lay down my life for people I don't like. Why? Because I love them and that's what Jesus wants me to do. Maybe you're asked to take someone to hospital. Well, I can't, you know, because I'm, I'm, I'm going to watch a football match on the TV that day. Or... Uh, It's a nice day. I think I'll sit in the garden and admire my flowers. And I really don't like you. And I don't want to spend my time in the car with you, taking you down a hospital appointment. Is that how we show our love? Later, the Apostle John will write, If anyone says, I love God, yet hates his brother, he is a liar. For anyone who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. And maybe you would say, well, I don't hate other Christians. I don't hate other people. But do you love them? And you know that Jesus often uses words uh, to contrast uh, opposites to drive a point home. And really what John is saying here is that the absence of love is almost like hate in Jesus' eyes. And we show our love for Jesus by telling him we love him and by showing it in our love for other people. But finally, we also show our love by trusting Jesus. The passage just before our reading was that occasion where the disciples were out in the boat. 
They'd been fishing. They'd caught nothing. Uh, Jesus is standing on the shore. It's early in the morning. They can't really make out who it is. And he tells them to cast the net on the other side. I don't know about you. I'm not very keen on people telling me my job. And yet, a church is full of people who know better than the minister how he should do his job. I have to say I get a bit prickly sometimes when people come and say, well, you should be doing this, you should be doing that, you should be doing it a different way. Try telling a fisherman how to fish. Or imagine me going to a farmer and telling him how to farm. I don't know anything about farming. On one occasion, I was looking after a, a church when I was a student, and um, I went to visit a man in the congregation, and I got out of the car, and he said, get into my car. I said, where are we going? Just get in. And we ended up on a farm. It was the young farmer's stock judging. And he took me around and he introduced me to people from the congregation and people. It was a wonderful night. Until we came on this pen and there were two bullocks in it. Guess the weight of the bullocks. Well, you would have heard the people in Larn laughing from here as I tried to guess the weight of two bullocks. Now it's two, we're not talking about one. And it's kilograms, it's not pounds. And every number I came up with, they laughed all the more. If they'd asked me to milk the thing, I would have been in difficulty. And they might well have done it for badness. But I don't know anything about farming. I can't go and tell a farmer how to farm. The only thing I, I, I hear in the news is that potatoes are going to be scarce. I love my potatoes. A wee bit of butter, a few scallions mixed in with them. A pint of milk. Oh, I'm getting hungry. And here's a man telling fishermen how to fish. And I'm quite sure that Peter and maybe some of the other disciples, what does he know about it? Who's he telling us how to fish? We're professionals. We've spent our life fishing. And then maybe somebody said, but hold on. Do you remember three years ago, a man told us to cast our net on the other side and we had such a huge catch of fish. Let's try it. Let's trust him. Let's do as he says. It might, be, it might seem silly to us, but we'll do it. And they did it. And they had a huge catch of fish. Let me say you can trust Jesus. And you show your love for Jesus by trusting him. In how you live your life. In how you live your church life. After telling Peter that he's going to suffer a violent death. Jesus says to him, follow me. violent death to difficult days ahead follow me that took Peter back one day he was walking with Andrew his brother and he was at the lake of Galilee when Jesus called him follow me and Peter, uh, Jesus is saying, Peter, nothing has changed. I'm still here. I still want you. But will you trust me? Will you love me? Will you follow me? We don't know where Jesus is going to lead. I was saying, 
to, to Jim before the service. Um, when I was moderator, I had the opportunity of going to Kenya, and I visited um, the reeds there. And I have to say that if there's one thing I, that God confirmed to me in that visit was the fact that I could not be a missionary. I couldn't have hacked it. We were there for three weeks. I was glad to be home. It was fascinating. It was life-changing. It was instructive. It was amazing, the work that they were doing. But I couldn't do it. And if Jesus had said, follow me to the mission field, I would have been in trouble. But Jesus didn't ask me to go to the mission field. He asked me to go on a different path. I started life as a teacher. And then he said, I want you to leave that. And I want you to follow me on a different path. And I trusted Jesus. Maybe there are some today who need to be restored. Maybe you've fallen out of love with Jesus. Maybe your trust is wavering. Maybe your love for other people isn't what it should be. Jesus asked Peter, do you love me? How would you answer that question today? (coughs) Jesus told Peter to feed, to care for others. Will you do that? Jesus called Peter to follow him. Will you follow Jesus today, wherever he'll lead you, into whatever situation? Will you say, yes, Lord, lead on? Let's pray. We thank you, our Father, for your word to us this morning. Grant us your Holy Spirit to help us to love Jesus to love other people, and to follow him. And all for his glory. Amen. We're going to close by singing hymn 315, I will sing the wondrous story of the Christ who died for me. Oh, oh, oh.
the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forevermore. Amen. <laughs>